Psalm 1 is surprisingly dense, so I figured I could do a video on it. And since it's relatively short, I'm going to let the app Logos read us this psalm, and then we'll come back and comment along. The Psalms Psalm 1 Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We're going to begin with some of the numerical aspects of the psalm and gematria and that kind of stuff. Now, gematria, some people do silly things with it. We're not doing that. For me, the check and balance has always been, does it serve the underlying text itself? Does it support what's plainly stated in the text? And this is a good example of exactly that. It is doing that. But if you don't know anything about gematria, it's basically number letter correspondence, right? So the numerical value of the letters. It's on one one aspect of it is as simple as A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3. It gets a little bit more complex. There are different systems, that kind of thing. But um, that's what we're dealing with here. And so we're going to rely heavily on Labashain's work. And he says, uh, or prior to that, I'm just pointing out here that there's 67 total Hebrew words, which is 52 plus 15. Those numbers will be relevant here momentarily. The number of words enveloping the meaningful center, that's 52 words, or 26 plus 26, represent the numerical value of the first word happy, or blessed in our translation, which is an important keyword occurring 26 times in the book of Psalms. So the entire book of Psalms, as uh, this word occurs 26 times. Now, I didn't explain this, but if you've watched our previous videos, 26 is the numerical value of the divine name Yahweh as well as 17, 17 or 26. So those numbers are important when they pop up structuring text, as in this case. The 52 or the double 26 is 52, which is the value for our term blessed. But again, that that's basically how this psalm is structured. It's structured around this 52. So uh, the seven word meaningful center of the text in verse 3b is positioned within a larger 15 word core around the pivotal word in season in a perfectly concentric menorah pattern. Here we see this kind of chiastic thing. He calls it a concentric menorah. But you have 26, 26, 4, 4, 3, 3, and then 1. The 1 in the center is the uh, the phrase in season in Hebrew. It's would be considered one word. Just notice that symmetry that we have there. So he continues on, since the 15-word inner core falls within the middle strophe, in uh, that's verse three. It cannot be excluded that the author intended the entire verse three to be the meaningful center. The fact that verse three is made up of exactly seventeen words, our other divine number, uh, underscores this supposition. It is not simply a matter of coincidence that the fifteen-word core is surrounded by fifty-two words, twenty-six plus fifteen plus twenty-six. The author used this pattern deliberately because fifty-two represents the numerical value of the keyword happy the very first word of the psalm, that we have to do with a key word of paramount importance is shown by the fact that it occurs 26 times in the Psalter as a unifying thread throughout the whole corpus. So that's kind of uh, the number stuff, and we'll move on to the psalm itself. So continuing on, uh, Willem van Gimmeren in his commentary says, the first psalm may have consisted of psalms 1 and 2, and this is actually what I was tracking on when I went down this rabbit hole. Um, according to some ancient manuscripts, the quotation of Psalm 2-7 in Acts 13-33 is introduced as the first psalm. In fact, Craigie, in his commentary, uh, says that the, the most ancient Greek manuscripts of Acts 13, it actually says the first psalm, and then he quotes what we would consider Psalm 2-7. Um, Brownlee argued in favor of the unity of the two psalms, but the evidence is not decisive. I actually think the evidence is pretty good, and I skipped over this, but the rabbinical traditions also 
um, you'll see this sometimes that they considered Psalms one and two to be one psalm. Van Gimmeren is going to uh, here he has the breakdown of the occurrences of this term blessed or happy the way it, depending on how they translate it. It's all twenty six occurrences. You can see the breakdown here. Um, I want to move down here. He this is also from Van Gimmeren. He says Psalms one and two are bound together by the opening and by closing with a blessing. So it forms something of an inclusio, Psalm 1 and 2, if you read them together, and they're bound by this, this term, um, blessed or happy. Continuing down, uh, J. Clinton McCann says Psalms 1 and 2 are only two of the four Psalms in Book 1 without a superscription. And in the cases of the other two, Psalms 10 and 33, these Psalms have clear connections with the preceding Psalms. So again, just more evidence that they should be read together. Uh, here's a longer quote from McCann. He says, um, Beatitudes occur in the first two Psalms of Book 1, Psalm 1 and 2, and the last two Psalms of Book 1, Psalms 40 and 41. The other four Beatitudes occur in three consecutive Psalms in the midst of the book. So Psalms 32, 33, 34. Granted, this distribution does not seem overly impressive, and some may conclude that it's simply coincidental. He continues on, I am willing to concede that the occurrences of the Beatitudes in the consecutive Psalms, while interesting, may be coincidental. The occurrences of the Beatitudes in Psalms 1 and 2 and 40 and 41 are another matter, however. This pattern seems to be more than coincidental. Indeed, it seems highly significant. And he continues on that vein. Um, Ken, uh, Kidner, in his commentary, he says, Preferable to blessed, for which a separate word exists, is happy or the happiness of. Such was the Queen of Sheba's exclamation in uh, 1 Kings 10.8, and is to be heard 26 times in the Psalter. Um, th this is when she says, like, happy are your um, servants or whatever, that hear your wisdom, that kind of thing. Um, I would kind of disagree, though, on one level, because I'm not sure that happy really captures the word for us either. But either way, this psalm goes on to show the sober choice that is its basis. The Sermon on the Mount, using the corresponding word in Greek, will go on to expound it still more radically. Now, this is interesting because I feel like whatever you do, whatever choice you make, whether you translate it blessed or happy, you should do so in the New Testament as well to create that verbal link. So most, if not all, I, I don't know, um, I've always heard is blessed, where Jesus says, you know, blessed are the meek or the poor in spirit, whatever. It's the corresponding Greek term is this term. So if you're going to translate what Jesus says as blessed, then we should, I think, translate it that way in the Old Testament and the Psalms and that kind of thing. But uh, continuing on, uh, Golden Gay has this, um, is just talking about some of the, um, a little bit more of the grammar side of things or whatever. Although this is important. He says, the subject of this declaration is, in Hebrew, haish, often a term for an individual person that is actually relevant. And we'll hit that again as we move down. Uh, Van Gemmeren here has chiastic structures to the, the psalm itself. So you can look at those if you want to. I'm not going to uh, focus too much on those. And here, Reardon, whose name sounds like a Pokemon to me. Uh, he's He has a long quote here, but it's it's very well worth reading. So we'll just go ahead and work our way through. He says, just who is this blessed man of whom the psalmist speaks? It is not man in general. In truth, it really is not simply a human being. The underlying words here translated as man are emphatically masculine, that is, gender-specific. In, uh, in the original Hebrew, as well as the Greek and Latin versions, they are not Hebrew, Adam, or Greek, Anthropos, nouns accurately translated as human being. The man of reference here is a particular man. According to the fathers of the church, he is the one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. The law of the Lord, which is to be our delight in meditation day and night, finds its meaning only in him. Christ is the only one who f fulfills it, and he is the key to its understanding. And I think that this is pretty important because many commentators are going to um, overemphasize, in my opinion, the idea that this applies to everybody, and which it does. But it applies to us in that we are emulating the man who it's about. It's about Jesus. Again, especially when you take one and two together as a unit, Psalm 2 is obviously ultimately about Christ. So Psalm 1, then, if it's to be read together, is also specifically about Christ. And again, it, it 
applies to us in that we emulate Christ, but it's ultimately about him. In fact, um, I didn't pick up on any of the commentaries discussion specifically of this, but I've seen it brought up before that in the line where it says on his law, he meditates day and night that the antecedent isn't to the Lord. That is, it's not the Lord's uh, law that he's meditating on per se. It's his law. It's the man's law, which doesn't make sense unless the man is also God, which only makes sense in Christ. Right. So um, it's just kind of interesting. Um, Boise in his commentary here, he's talking about the, um, uh, kind of the nature of how chaff is uh, was carried out, like how they threshed wheat and that kind of thing. Uh, so commenting on this line about the chaff that the wind drives away. But uh, this is worth bring, bringing up. I, th- I think it's important. He says, the wicked are like chaff in two senses. Chaff is worthless and chaff is burned. This pictures the futile, empty, worthless life of the godless, as well as their inevitable judgment. And... I want to transition back over into uh, Lagos here because on this note of judgment, there's something of an eschatological feel to it, especially that because the chaff that the wind drives away. In fact, the LXX, and let's go ahead and bring this in. So the Greek version actually adds a line at the end of that. It says, um, it has this redundant line, not so the godly, uh, the ungodly. So not so the ungodly, not so. But rather they are like the chaff that the wind spreads abroad away from the face of the land. And a translation of the Septuagint I've actually seen says away from the face of the earth. Which brings, it has very much a judgment feel to it that they're just wiped out completely. But even more significant to this is um, this is verse 5 here. It says, on account of this, the ungodly will not stand in the judgment, nor will the sinful stand in the counsel of the righteous. Now, a lot of commentators, when they get to the Greek, they'll sometimes, um, they, they, they're going to zero in on this being very much about like judicial systems and kind of a very earthly um, feel to it. Like they, they want to have access to uh, courts and things like that. But I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a, a rapture person. I think the rapture is just simply the second coming. This is actually pretty interesting. Verse 5, on account of this, the ungodly will not stand up in the judgment. The The term here, as we can see, as I click on it, it highlights over here as well as down here. So this is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, as you can see here, it's the same lemma. And even down here, that the dead in Christ will rise first is actually the exact same form of it here. So on account of this, the ungodly will not stand up in judgment, nor will the sinful stand in the uh, counsel of the righteous. The the idea here is that this is a a resurrection term, basically. And so that it has something of an eschatological feel, I I don't think is uh, particularly, I don't think it's a stretch. You know, some of the commentators treat it that way. But when I look at it, I I can't help but think that they are connected um, to, or verse five, it, has that feel of of ultimate judgment uh, in mind from here i think we can look at some of the connections between psalm one and two like at least verbally Uh, on this line here where it says on this on his law he meditates day and night the term here for meditates is the same term used in psalm two for the people's plot in vain Um, so it's another one of these verbal links we have uh what other ones do we have i know we have a couple of other ones. We again, we have happy here or blessed, um, which is at the end here, where it says, "Kiss the son, lest lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled." Blessed are all who take refuge in him. In fact, perish also, I think, is this term down here, um, but the wicked will perish. So you have these a bunch of these verbal connections between these two psalms. It seems very, very well connected. Uh, and I may even have missed one, but uh, one of the things I want to get to just because it's extensive, I've done stuff on it before, but I, I can't help but bring it up again, is you have this language here of uh, its leaf does not wither. And people will often connect this to specifically to Josh, I'm sorry, not Joshua, uh, Jeremiah 17, I think specifically. Um, but what's interesting to me is this term, this leaf term, and I, I didn't see any of the various commentators bring this up. 
but this is actually a really rare term. Um, you would think it would it'd be more common, but it's really not. So Genesis 3, 5, no, not 15. Is it 8? This is where, you know, they hear the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Um, maybe it's right before, yeah, it's verse 7, where they sowed themselves fig leaves. But leaves here is the same term. And like I said, it's, it's a pretty rare term. And the only places where you have actually fig leaves show up together in conjunction is in um, this passage here where they make for themselves fig leaves. If you want to see a little bit more of this, watch my video on Cain and Abel because I, I talk about a lot of this stuff. Um, the other one was Jeremiah. It's I think it's 8.13 specifically or it's somewhere in 8. Yeah, it, it says, When I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no graves on the vine nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered and what I give, gave them has passed away from them. But here we have figs and fig tree and leaves in conjunction here. And th this is the only other place other than this one as well as, let's go ahead and jump over to e, not Ezekiel, it's Isaiah 34. I always want to say 24. 24 is kind of similar. There, there's a lot of weird divine counsel type stuff going on here. But here you have people being devoted to destruction and, or is it, oh yeah, it is the nations. But in 24, you actually have God punishing the powers in heaven um, as well as, you know, the kingdoms on earth as well. But verse four here, all the host of heaven shall rot away and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their host shall fall as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. And again, leaves um, as well as uh, fig. Again, it's our same terms, somewhat rare terms. But all of these passages have very eschatological feels. Um, another video I uh, talked about this stuff in a little bit is um, the triumphal entry. Because this passage really foreshadows very well where Jesus, um, he goes into, after the triumphal entry, he goes in and he, there's this like, especially in Mark, you have this like paralleling account of Jesus going back and forth from the temple. And you have, this is where he curses that fig tree and it withers away and that kind of thing. And it's symbolic of the judgment on the temple, the old system, the old covenant type system, the temple system, all of that. So it's judgment on that age. And again, this is the Messiah doing this. And so I, I, did, I think it's very fitting then that we actually have some of this language all the way back in Psalm 1 of the leaves here not withering. Um, but again, this is all contingent on the Messiah, on um, the God-man, so to speak. Because it, it, this stuff, like in Jeremiah and Isaiah, they have that end of the age feel to it. The old system is being judged. And again, like it says here, what... I gave them has passed away from them. And so we have that movement away from them, but it also is, I think, being alluded to here very softly here in uh, Psalm 1 and 2. And some people would even, you know, have this about the people raging and plotting in vain against the Lord's anointed, which they would connect to the various enemies of Christ when he was, you know, on earth. And, um, but yeah, that there's just, there's a lot going on here. And, I, I think part of it too, you, you get into an eschatological fill of Psalm one in verse five, you know, with the, the people not standing, which is, you know, the resurrection language in Greek. And, um, but here again, even some commentators have noted the somewhat Edenic imagery here of, you know, the trees planted by the streams of water, that kind of thing. So there's just a lot going on in such a small Psalm. It's pretty incredible. Um, but, um, that's about all. By the way, I made a Facebook page just so I could, I, I hate Facebook, but I did it just so that I can link over to the YouTube stuff. But if you're interested, I will, um, I'll post like the notes that I was looking through on there so that you can, you know, you can have those for yourself. But uh, anyway, um, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll go over some additional Psalms in the future, but um, I just thought it was interesting and worth pointing some stuff out, but uh, I'll see you next time.